This is the video on Newton's third law of motion. So remember in the video, there are going to be three or two codes. Uh, one is a written code that will pop up on the screen. The other code will be a verbal code said by myself at some point. Each code is three numbers and you will need them to move on with any uh, homework assignment. So uh, when you're looking at these uh, notes, uh, or when you're watching this video, when you're looking at these slides, uh, write what is in green. What's in green is going to uh, be the important things uh, that you can write down. You can make a nice little bulleted list. So this is the written code. I would recommend you write this down somewhere. All right. So this is uh, Newton's third law of motion. Newton's third law of motion is also known as the law of action and reaction. So you probably know this like for every action, there is an equal and opposite reaction. So um, this is it written mathematically. It's not really like an equation that we're going to, to use, but basically this states that the force of A acting on B is equal and opposite. That's what that negative signs is of the force of B acting on A. For a reaction, there's an equal and opposite reaction. Now, I want you to notice like you can write down Newton's third law, right? For every action, there's an equal and opposite reaction. But uh, what I want you to do is I want you to understand it, right? And to do that, what we're going to do is we're going to write down what Newton's third or third law implies. So forces always occur in pairs. So it takes two to tango, right? There's no such thing as a lone force. Force pairs are always equal in magnitude, in size, right? And force pairs are always oppositely directed. Now, notice I didn't have you write down Newton's uh, third law. Like if you want to, great. But this summarizes it, right? For every action, there's a reaction. And those, they're always equal and opposite. Now, those force pairs always occur simultaneously, which means they start at the same time. They end at the same time. They're applied for the exact same amount of time. And force pairs never cancel because they act on two different bodies. So th that brings us to this uh, sort of like horse cart riddle, right? So this is a famous physics problem. It's a horse cart problem. It goes something like this. A farmer wants to take his produce to market, so he loads up his cart and tells his horse to giddy up. The horse turns and looks at him and says, no, it would be futile for me to pull on the wagon because by Newton's third law, if I pull on the wagon, the wagon will pull back on me with an equal and opposite force. As a consequence, there will be no net force and thus no acceleration. Therefore, I will just stay here grazing on this grass. Now, what he says makes sense. Like what this horse says makes sense. But we know that horses can pull carts, right? So we're, there are two different objects here that we have to look at right? So the horse pulls on the cart, the cart pulls on the horse. I know that these are equal. They're opposite. Now, they're not going to cancel out like the horse says because well, they're acting on two different objects, right? One's acting on the cart, the other is acting on the horse. So if I look at the free body diagram for each of these, right? Let's take a look at the cart. Uh, so obviously, I've got gravity pulling down, the normal force supporting it, uh, and I have that applied force that the horse is pulling on. And the frictional force, that's just from the axles on the wheels. Now, let's just take a look at the horse free body diagram. So I've got gravity, I've got the normal force, and the applied force is what the cart is pulling on the horse with. Now, what I want you to see here is that, well, the frictional force, right? That's what causes this horse to move forward. They're pushing off the ground. The ground is pushing that horse forward. That's what's going to accelerate. But notice that I've got an action and reaction they don't cancel because they're acting on two different objects. So there will be, the, the horse will be able to accelerate that cart. So let's take a look at this one, right? Which football player is hitting harder, right? So if we look at football hits, right? So let's take a look at player A and B, which exerts a larger force and magnitude to the other player. You'd probably be tempted to say, well, B is obviously hitting A harder, right? But that's not true. We know Newton's third law says that for every action, there's an equal and opposite reaction. Now, which player applied that force first? Well, we know that those forces are simultaneous. Those force pairs are simultaneous, so they start at the same time. Which player applied that force for a longer period of time? Like I said, simultaneous. They're being applied for the same amount of time. If the forces are equal and opposite, why don't they cancel out? Well, we know that they act on two different objects. One of the forces acting on A, one of them is acting on B. Now, here is the key to the whole thing. Which player does that force have a larger effect on? You can see that it's going to have a larger effect on player A, right? They're hitting each other with the same force and magnitude. However, the effect is not the same. So B hits A, A hits B. 
that four, those force pairs are going to be equal. They're opposite. They're simultaneous, but the effect is larger on A. So let's take a look at another one, a bug hitting a windshield, right? So this one really uh, separates cause and effect, right? So which object, the bug or that windshield, exerts a larger force and magnitude to the other object? So you'd probably be tempted to say, obviously, that windshield hits that bug harder because, well, it's, it's going to be it, because it spiders, right? The car barely does anything. But we know that Newton's third law says that they're equal. Now, which applied that force first? They're simultaneous. So they start at the same time. They end at the same time. They're applied for the same amount of time. Now, if the forces are equal and opposite, why don't they cancel out? Well, we know that they are that they are applied to two different objects. One's applied to the bug, one's applied to the windshield. Now, which object, the bug or the windshield, does that force have a larger effect on? So it's going to have a larger effect on the bug because the bug is much smaller. It has a much smaller resistance to change in motion, much smaller inertia, much smaller mass, right? So it, it's going to accelerate a lot more, right? If you're driving and a bug hits your windshield, you're barely going to notice it, right? The, the car barely does anything, but it's going to have a larger effect on that bug right? Bug on the windshield, windshield on bug. They're equal, they're opposite, but that, that same small force has a much larger effect on that bug. All right, so that brings us to this lab, don't nickel and dime me. This one is just sliding a nickel and a dime into each other, and this is like a collision. They're, they're applying a force to each other, and what I wanted you to see on this one is that the dime launches in one direction, the nickel just kind of stops. Well, we know that those forces are equal. They're opposite. They're simultaneous. But it's going to have a larger effect on that dime because it has a much smaller mass. So that just sort of reiterates, well, force pairs and cause and effect. What determines the winner of a game of tug of war, right? So this is a video of uh, tug of war. Uh, with, and uh, let's take a look at a game of tug of war, right? So which team... Exert, if I got two teams, right, A and B, they're playing tug of war. Which team exerts a larger force and magnitude to the other team by pulling on the rope? Well, we know that they're applying uh, the same force, equal and opposite. Which team applies that force first? Starts at the same time. Longer period of time, it ends at the same time. If they're equal and opposite, why don't they cancel out? They're acting on two different objects. How does a team win a game of tug of war, right? So let's take a look at this, right? So A pulls on B, B pulls on A, they're the exact same force. They do, it's not the stronger team that's going to win. Now, here's what determines the winner, and I'll give you a little hint here. Let's just say I put team A on a block of ice, and let's just say I put team B on like some rubber matting, right, so they can get traction. You're obviously going to look at this and say, well, team B is going to win. It doesn't matter how strong team A is, A is just going to be slipping around. So we have to look at all the forces acting on them. And what you're doing in a game of tug of war is you're using that friction on the ground to pull the team in the other direction. So it's the team that has that larger frictional force. The one that can get the most amount of traction is going to be the one that wins. It's not going to be the stronger team. And friction, well, it does depend you know, mostly, you know, the nature and condition of surfaces and how hard they're being pressed together. So a lot of times it's the heavier team that wins because they're pressing down. They're usually standing on the same thing. So why was tug of war removed from the Olympics? Well, here's the tug of war controversy, right? So in, in the modern Olympics, right, the tug of war contest was between two teams of eight. One team had to pull the other six feet along in order to win. After five minutes, no team had done this. The, the team which had pulled the greater distance was declared the winner. So these are the winners in 1908. You can see they're all Great Britain, but they're also police, right? The city of London, a police, Liverpool police, Metropolitan police. So yeah, they, they all won. Now, at London in 1908, the American team protested its first round loss to Liverpool police, claiming that the Liverpoolians were wearing illegal boots. When the Liverpool team challenged the United States to a rematch without shoes, there was no response from the Americans who withdrew their team uh, comprised of athletes competing in other events. So the rules had stipulated you had to wear ordinary shoes. And the police team said, well, their giant work boots were ordinary to them, so they could wear them. Now, wearing large work boots, I mean, they're designed for traction. When playing tug of war, the team that has the best traction is usually going to win. Now, technique usually does play a role, but when you're, when you're using technique, all that technique is to gaining more traction, that more friction. So 
this brings us to another one. How do rockets work in the vacuum of space where there's nothing to push off of? So we did this lab, Hero's Engine, where you pour water into this uh, like cup with straws in it, and the Hero's Engine spins. So this is how it's very similar to how rockets work, right? So here's how cars accelerate. Tires rotate, but not sliding on the ground. The tires are providing a frictional force on the ground. The ground provides a reaction force on the tires. Planes accelerate. Engine pushes the air back. The air providing the reaction force on the engine, pushing the plane forward. Now, let's take a look at rockets, right? So first, let's look at the car. I've got a mass. Great. Tires, frictional force on the ground. Ground on tires. Well, I'm going to have a net force, and I'm going to have an acceleration. Planes, well, I'm going to have engine pushing the air back. The air pushes on the engine. I'm going to have a net force. Well, I'm going to have an acceleration. Now, here's the thing, right? Rockets, there's no friction in space. There's no air in space. There's nothing to, like, push off of or, or, or do anything, right? So rockets ignite the fuel, pressing gas out the back of it at an incredible speed. Well, the ignited gas provides a reaction force on that rocket. But when you're in rockets, you have to bring what you're going to push off of, right? You have to bring fuel, right? You have to bring that like reaction mass. If you don't have anything to push off of, like you're, you're kind of out of luck. You're not going to be able to, to move. So you do have to provide something to push off of. That is how rockets work in space. So let's take a look at the Goddard rocket. Robert H. Goddard launched the world's first liquid-fueled rocket on March 16, 1926 in Auburn, Massachusetts. The rocket, which was later dubbed Nell, rose just 41 feet during 2.5-second flight that ended 184 feet away in a cabbage field. People were skeptical about whether rockets would work in space. In fact, even the New York uh, Times article in 1920 basically said this about Goddard. After the rocket quits our air and really starts on its longer journey to the moon, its flight would be neither accelerated, uh, not maintained by the proposed by Goddard solid rocket based on uh, explosion of charges. To claim that would uh, be as to not deny a fundamental law of dynamics, and only Dr. Einstein and his chosen dozen, so few fit in, are licensed to do that. And I like this one because it's sort of, they, they definitely like slandered uh, Goddard. Professor Goddard, with his chair in Clark College and the count, uh, countenancing of Smithsonian Institution, does not know the relation of action and reaction and of the need to have something better than a vacuum against which to react. To say that would be absurd. Of course, he only seems to lack the knowledge ladled out in daily high schools. So basically, the New York Times said, well, there's no way this is going to work in space. There's nothing to push off of, right? But they later did... Uh, issue a correction. June 17, 1969, the Apollo 11 crew was on the way to the first landing of the man on the moon. That day, the New York Times had a special 20-page section of all things related to space, flight, and rocketry. There, it finally printed a sort of apologetic correction to Goddard, admitting that rockets would work in space. So Goddard was right. Like You just have to have something to push off of in space. Now, what happens if you get separated from your spaceship? So let's just say you get separated from your spaceship, right? If you have something to throw, like not, not all hope is lost, right? So if you're throwing like a wrench or something, uh, you want to throw it in the opposite direction. Because let's take a look, right? You've got a mass, mass, great. You throw that wrench or whatever you're throwing in the opposite direction, well, it's going to apply a, a reaction force back to you, right? So yeah, you're going to have an acceleration. And if it's just enough, if you throw it hard enough, it'll accelerate you back towards your uh, spaceship, right? Because it's action reactions. The same force, uh, same amount of time. They don't cancel because they act on two different objects. Now, it's going to have a larger effect on that wrench, but it just needs to have a small enough uh, reaction or a uh, small enough effect on the astronaut to accelerate them back to the spaceship. Um, so once again, I'll give you the verbal code at this time. The verbal code is 752. Say that again. The verbal code is 752. All right. All right. So just as a final thought, remember, there's too much unknown in the universe to take a break from learning. Get out there and question everything.